now that we're all here. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to the 2020 RU presentation. Uh, this is the, the, the final six week of, of research for five students. Uh, normally, our RU program is called at Stone Laboratory, and the RU students are conducting uh, their, their, their own hands-on data collection or running experiments. Um, however, that was not possible this year due to COVID and the campus closures, but we still wanted to give the RU students an opportunity to do, do research this year. Um, you, you'll hear from five students. Um, all, uh, um, you'll, you'll hear from five students today. All students conducted a, a data analysis uh, using previously collected data. Um, however, you know, a lot of science is done through analyzing other people's data or downloading data from instruments that are deployed that are deployed far away. So, you know, you know this type of research that the REU students did this summer is not really new to science. It's quite common, you know, to do data analysis of other people's. You know, however, what is new to science since COVID is these virtual meetings, these virtual conferences, and meeting with your collaborators, collaborators over Zoom or WebEx or all these other forms. Um, so, so you know, just want to remind you know the students and the presenter or the, the attendees that you know doing a virtual RU uh, doesn't. You know, it's you're not doing the hands-on experience, but you're still gaining the valuable uh, experience of analyzing data, uh, finding data that you're not collecting, um, and and uh, and generating a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, we do not have a guest speaker, or I'm sorry, a guest presenter this week, but we do have um, a guest VIP. Uh, I want to uh, introduce. Um, um, introduce Dr. Jan Weisenberger, who is the Senior Associate Vice President of, of the Office of Research, and she's also Stone Lab's big, biggest supporter down on the Columbus campus. Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, so I am, I always call myself, I'm the cheerleader for Stone Lab down on the Columbus campus. Um, and most summers, it is a highlight of my summer to come up to the island, to the lab, and hear the student REU presentations. And of course, we're doing that a different way this summer. As Justin pointed out, and, and I'd like to sort of riff off this a little bit, something that has become increasingly clear to me in all the various groups that I work with, both within the university and outside the university, is that we need to be thinking very hard about the fact that what we're doing right now, while it's different and it's a pivot, we wanna not think of it as simply a poor substitute for what we would be doing otherwise. We need to be thinking about what are the positive aspects of this more virtual experience and what are the, the lessons that we're gonna take with us even when we emerge out the other side. So as I talk to our partners in industry, many of them have said, you know, the ability to connect virtually has expanded our network so much and we're getting to know lots of people that we otherwise wouldn't have gotten to know. So that's a positive. The technology that we can put to bear that allows us to do our work under these current circumstances, pieces of that are gonna go with us as we go forward, even after the pandemic's over. And as Justin pointed out, and I'm gonna riff on him for a little bit, there are massive treasure troves of data out there that have been collected. And in a conversation I was in recently with some of our microscopy people, they were saying, when we image things using an electron microscope, and we give the results to the uh, researcher, we are maybe using 20% of the available information that we have gotten from that image. And imagine what new discoveries we could make 
if we analyzed the other 80% of those data. And so in thinking about the experiences that all of you have had this summer, this is exactly in that realm. It's perhaps an unexpected treasure that we're getting from this current experience where we might have ignored some of the existing data. So it was a good experience, I think, for all of you, even if it wasn't the experience you thought you were going to have. And it's important going forward to think, what did I learn from this, either about myself, about the research process, or about technology that I really do want to take with me as I go forward? And so I want to say congratulations to all of you. Everybody has had to become incredibly flexible and incredibly good at operating in the presence of not complete information about how the world is going to be. And hopefully we'll come out the other side of this better and stronger. So I look forward to hearing everybody's presentations tonight. All right, thank you, Jan, for those uh, those nice words. Uh, as I as I said before, Dr. Winslow will be joining us later. He had a uh, an important meeting that was just just scheduled, so he's going to join hopefully around 4:30. He said, but hopefully sooner. Uh, so the the order of presentations will follow the tradition of of. Of, of that we have at Stone Lab for the RU presentations following the order of, of the food web. Um, before each student presents, I'll ask the supervisors to unmute themselves and introduce the student. Uh, the presentations will be about, should be about 12 minutes long uh, with about, about three minutes for question and answers. Uh, for questions, please type the questions into the chat and I will serve as the moderator, and I will read the questions uh, following the presentation. Um, uh, Christina, could you give any last minute WebEx questions that we may need? Absolutely. Um, if you as an attendee have questions, like Justin said, you can put those in the chat box, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. If it's not, there should be a row of buttons at the bottom of your screen. Um, one of those is a speech bubble, and if you click that, it should pop up the chat. Um, you can send questions either to uh, all panelists or directly to Dr. Chaffin. Um, either will be fine. And if you have any technical questions or issues, feel free to send those also via the chat to, again, either all panelists or to me. Um, or to the host, which is also me. Um, but yeah, I think that should cover everything. All right, thanks, Christina. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, our first presenter is, is my student. Um, so the, our first speaker is Peter Zimmerman, who's a rising junior at Oberlin College. Peter, uh, Peter uh, one of his supervisors at Oberlin College and another student, uh, visited Stone Lab to measure primary productivity uh, during January 2020. Um, after working with Peter for three weeks during uh, Oberlin College's winter term or winter break, um, I encouraged Peter to apply for the RU program. And I had a couple uh, projects in mind uh, for him to do that involved, uh, you know, that involved algae and, and uh, running experiments. But we couldn't do that. Um, so I, you know, I thought about how can we use the data that Peter collected during the winter. Um, so an obvious question we had was, well, how does the data we collected during the winter compare to summer? So Peter is going to talk about comparisons between winter and summer nutrient concentrations in Lake Erie's Western Basin. So with that, Peter, you can go ahead and get started. I'll I'll mute myself and turn off my screen. So go ahead, Peter. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Justin. Yeah. So um, I'm sorry. Let's see. So as Justin said, um, I'm comparing uh, the nutrient concentrations between the winter and the summer. So there has been a lot of research um, in the summer 
um, not just about uh, not just for uh, nutrients, but about the harmful algal blooms, um, hypoxia events, and nutrient transformation and cycling. Um, but with the winter, there isn't as much. Um, uh, of the re the other uh, research I did read about, um, we know there's spring nighttime blooms, and that there's generally low uh, biological productivity. So um, why is there uh, that gap? Um, so there's several reasons. Um, first being that uh, because there's so much going on in the summer, um, it's often referred to as the growing season, um, researchers are just focused on that uh, instead of the winter. Um, additionally, there's a lot of challenges that come with uh, winter field work on Lake Erie. Um, you know, there's a lot of shifting ice conditions, which uh, can make getting to the sampling sites very difficult. Um, it can be very dangerous. Um, you can see here from uh, 1940, <laughs> Um, David Chandler, who worked at Stone Lab, um, you can see how he tackled that. Um, certainly not the safest thing. Um, so, and you can also have uh, freezing of sampling equipment. Um, that was a challenge that we had is um, when we were collecting data in the winter, how do we keep our intake or our sampling equipment from freezing? Um, so I hope to fill in that data gap um, as one of my objectives. Um, and to see if I really could quantify any differences um, between the seasonal and nutrient concentrations. So um, as to what nutrients and parameters I was focusing on, um, specifically uh, ammonium is one. So that's the, uh, the first nutrient really that's absorbed by or used. Um, uh, nitrate uh, is the most abundant but least favored form. Um, nitrite, which is an intermediate of nitrate, um, Dissolved reactive phosphorus, or DRP, um, is a favorite form of phosphorus, as well as silicate. Um, and that's really important to diatoms as they use it to construct their cell walls. Um, other things that I uh, measured uh, were chlorophyll A, um, which is a good indicator of algal biomass, and turbidity and specific conductivity. Um, turbidity is essentially a measure of water clarity, um, and then specific conductivity. Um, measures the conductivity of the water. Um, uh, but both can be used to differentiate between water masses, um, which I'll explain later how that is helpful to me. So for uh, the sample locations, um, here is a map showing it, it is in the Western Basin, uh, just on the border between the Western and Central Basin um, on South Bass Island. Just here's the lab right here, so labs. Um, their water, water quality lab, um, and that's where the winter collecting site was. But for the summer data, um, it came from uh, a two meter integrated tube sampling adjacent to the buoy. Um, and you can see that here. Um, for our winter setup, we had a direct intake going into the lab. Here you can see the pump, and that ran, ran into a five gallon bucket with a YSI sonde. And we directly took samples from the hose. So once we had the samples, once we collected the sample, they then needed to be analyzed. So for chlorophyll, we used a fluoroprobe. Um, and for the nutrients, we used a, a seal nutrient analyzer, which is it's, it's really great. You can do a lot, uh, do pretty much all the nutrients at once. Um, it's just a lot of work to set up. Um, so as to which summers we ended up using, um, uh, we wanted to get a good range of different summers um, that are pretty variable. So we used 2015, which was a large bloom. 2016 uh, was a small bloom. And then 2019 just as the most recent summer. So once we had all the data collected, um, we then had to perform uh, statistical analyses on it. So I did a ANOVA statistical test, um, which helped to calculate the p-value, which determines variance just as a whole. Um, and then what's really important uh, in determining uh, differences is the two key test. Um, and you can determine variance between really any two groups. Um, so the next thing that I did was um, I had to plot all of that. Um, so I did box and whisker plots for all the parameters. 
as well as um, time series to show temporal patterns. Um, if there were no temporal patterns, I just excluded it because um, I, I, there wouldn't be enough time to go over that. But um, so here's an example of the box and whisker plot. Um, on the y-axis, we have the specific parameter. So this is ammonium and its concentration. Uh, here we have a label for the different winter, um, different years and seasons. Um, these are these are the same for everything. So uh, summer 2015 is blue, 2016 is red, 19 is green, and 2020 winter is purple. And so these box on the skirt plots, you can see, they show the range of data. Um, so the top and bottom uh, here, if you need to read that, but what's important is the mean is the X here, you can see there, um, and there, and then, uh, well, I guess I know the pointer, but um, the line in the middle is the median. So looking at ammonia, we can see there is uh, definitely a higher ammonium concentration. Now, one thing I, I, I just forgot to mention, but the results of the two key test um, we did, I, I did plot on the whisker plots, and you can see these different letters. Um, similar letters um, uh, are associated with similar groups. So you can see A is different from B. So in this case, 2020 winter is different um, with A being higher. Um, so ammonia didn't really have a temporal pattern. Um, phosphorus, uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus in the winter also had a higher uh, concentration, uh, as you can see here. Um, likewise, silicate was higher, uh, much higher actually, um, nearly three times, the average is nearly three times that of when compared to the summers. Um, nitrate concentrations were also greater, except when you compare it to 2015. Um, if you recall, that was the large bloom year. Um, so a lot of there were a lot of excess nutrients in the lake during that time from all the rain and the runoff. Um, so nitrate showed no temporal pattern in the winter, but it is worth noting that uh, summer there is an overall decreasing trend to show. Um, the winter nitrate concentrations they were not significantly different um, compared to the early summers, and the temporal trend for nit nitrite closely follows that of nitrate. Uh, given that it's an intermediate. So uh, chlorophyll A, um, it was lower in the winter, uh, except when you compare it to 2016, uh, which was the drought year. Um, so there really wasn't much uh, algae, at least that we could quantify using chlorophyll A. Um, and here you can see that in the summer, when you have these blooms in late summer, it really, you can really see that here. Um, on the left graph, which shows uh, the summer chlorophyll A concentrations. In the winter, you can see on the right, um, really not much going on. So another, I mentioned earlier about um, specific connect connectivity and turbidity. So it's really useful when trying to differentiate between different water masses. Um, so if you see on the bottom graph. Um, this is from the winter and it shows uh, various peaks in specific connectivity. Um, so if you look at the blue arrow, um, that uh, cor cor or corresponds to February 2nd. Um, and if you look at the blue arrow on the upper graph, this is just nitrate as an example. I could have picked a, another nutrient. Um, but if you see there's a spike uh, and that day for both um, specific connectivity and nitrate. So, um, and here's uh, the picture taken, the aerial picture. Um, that's a even more striking way to see that um, from there. Um, so as for how, how did my data really compare to other studies, um, Hampton et al. Likewise, they found that dissolved, dissolved nitrogen concentrations were typically higher, um, and chlorophyll was lower when compared to summer. Um, and one thing about uh, this winter is there really wasn't much ice. Um, Blank et al. found 
that mild winters affected nitrogen silica concentration positively and phosphorus concentration negatively. So that brings up the question of how do different winters compare based on ice cover? Um, and how, how does that affect nutrients and nutrient concentrations? Um, so that's something that uh, could definitely be looked into. Um, here you can see 2020 on the very end here. Um, much, much lower. There was practically none. Um, it was it never really fully iced over. Um, so that's uh, pretty much all I have. Uh, as for my acknowledgments, I would like to thank um, the Friends of Film Lab for funding the RU um, and the Great Lakes Commission HABS Collaborative um, for funding the project that I did in January with my professor from Oberlin. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Chaffin for being my mentor and helping with the research in the winter, um, as well as uh, Dr. Rachel Evelis, um, my professor, uh, Kira Stanislawczyk, um, who pretty much trained me and uh, the other student, Eliza Goodell, um, to help us with all processing and collecting all this data from the winter. Um, so with that, um, I guess, opening up to questions. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, we have a question from Doug Kane. Uh, Dr. Kane asked, were the number of sampling days used for summer versus winter to minimize differences between them? So the actual, the duration then? Let me go back. So for summer, we um, we defined it as June uh, June first through September thirtieth, and then for winter, we actually started we started uh, really late December through March thirtieth. Um, yeah, so I guess that's something I could refine or consider is making it so that that the range is the same. I know that uh, we definitely had more data from the winter um, when compared to the summer. Um, we were sampling every day in the winter for the most part, um, at least as, as, as long as we could, so. Okay, Dr. Kane says thanks. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, and again, uh, I'm not sure how to thank Peter. If you all can clap um, at home, that would be great. We have one more question that just came in. So, uh, Dr. Brian Ford, who's a, a, the new assistant director at Stone Lab, who uh, spoke during one of our meetings. Uh, he asked, what is the fate of winter ammonia and silica in Lake Erie? Uh, does it remain in the water column? So, so, Peter, what do you think happens to those nutrients that we measure in the winter? Yeah, so ammonia, um, as I mentioned previously in, the, in my presentation, is the most favored form, or it's, it, it's the fastest nutrient that is uh, uh, to be taken up by um, al algae and bacteria. Um, and so that it's as long as there's no algae in the water, at least, um, it's going to accumulate. So that's why we see those higher concentrations. Um, so, um, that uh, once you see the space icon blooms, and once those start uh, growing, the, the silicate will most likely uh, start to decrease as you progress. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, again, let's all thank Peter in uh, the best way we can. And we'll move on. So our next presenter is Alexis, and I'll ask Dr. Beatty to introduce Alexis. So if it's screen, uh, 
Alexis, you can change the, the PowerPoint to yours, and we'll let Darren introduce you. Okay, I think hopefully you can hear me. Um, I had the uh, pleasure of working with Alexis Brown this uh, summer uh, to work on a project that before the uh, coronavirus um, outbreak was originally planned on being quite uh, intense in this sort of data analysis of existing data that, that we actually did do here. But I had hoped to, uh, to include some amount of uh, lab work just for uh, a well-rounded project. So it wasn't too big of a challenge, I think, for us to switch into this, um, this style of a presentation. And so Alexis is a senior at Cleveland State University and one of the probably the main reason that I uh, chose her for this RU is that uh, she's um, majoring in uh, biology, but also is minoring in math and statistics. So a I would say a perfect and somewhat rare combination in uh, biology students that uh, made her. Uh, Sort of an excellent choice for this particular project. So uh, I think well, we were pretty successful this summer in doing what we set out to do. And so I will uh, let uh, Alexis show you her uh, excellent work. All right, thank you, Dr. Beatty. So our project was developing an early alert system for harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie. And we used sensors that are stationed on buoys in Lake Erie in order to do our analysis. So harmful algal blooms are characterized by the explosive growth of a single species of algae. And some of these blooms, though not all, produce toxins. And these can be very harmful to the environment and to humans. So one of the most infamous cases around Lake Erie was the 2014 Toledo water crisis where over 400,000 people were without clean water. So the other costs to algal blooms include the death of wildlife, um, toxins that cause illness and hospitalization in humans, and economic costs to the fishing industry, tourism, and even water treatment plants. So the ultimate goal of our project is to develop an automated early warning system so we're hoping to analyze data from sensors near the intake valves of water treatment plants and develop a, a notification system that sends text alerts directly to plant operators when an impending bloom may occur so they can begin dispensing those treatment chemicals to eliminate the toxins in the water. So in order to understand how our method works, you'll need to understand alternate states of an ecosystem. So for our purposes, we have two main states, the low algal abundance state, where there's a diverse algal community and no bloom present. This will be referred to as our baseline state. Then our alternate state is the high algal abundance state, where one species of algae, in our case in Lake Erie, it'll be one species of cyanobacterial algae, uh, dominates the algal population, and this is when a bloom can occur. Then you also need to know about the transition state, which is an unstable state that occurs between the baseline and alternate states. And the theory of regime shifts between alternate states of an ecosystem states that you can expect to see an increase in variance of some key ecosystem parameter before that shift occurs. So to explain increasing variance, uh, when we're in our baseline state or our alternate state, we will expect to see some amount of variance in the amount of phycocyanin, which is the pigment specifically found in cyanobacterial algae. But during that transition state, the amount of variance in that phycocyanin reading is expected to increase dramatically. And that's the signal we're looking for in order to predict when this alternate state will occur. So the mathematical principle you'll need to understand is the likelihood ratio, which tells whether a data point or a set of data is more likely to fall with, 
within one distribution or another. So our two distributions are the baseline state and the transition state. We will be using a specific ratio called the quickest detection or QD ratio, which compares the likelihood of falling in the transition distribution versus the baseline distribution. And if that ratio is greater than one, we know it falls somewhere in that transition distribution and there's potentially an impending bloom. If it's less than one, it falls within that base distribution and we can expect there is no impending bloom. And finally, you'll need to understand the concept of a rolling window. So in order to explain, I chose the seven day rolling window as an example. So how this works is as soon as we get seven days of data, phycocyanin data, we can run our analysis one time using those seven data points. So we'll take the standard deviation of that phycocyanin reading, calculate the QD ratio and our alarm statistic, and we'll see that in this case, the QD ratio is less than one, so it falls within that baseline state. And we can conclude that there's no alarm going to be triggered. If we shift that window forward a couple days, our QD ratio is now greater than one, and we can expect it to fall within the transition state. So that means that we can expect a possible alarm to be triggered, but if you notice, that plot does not fall solidly within the transition state. It's kind of between the overlap of the baseline and transition state. So that's where we need to set a minimum threshold that guarantees with, uh, within a reasonable amount that it will be in the transition state and we can solidly conclude that there may be an impending bloom. And so with the seven day window, it will shift forward uh, let me go back one slide. So it will shift forward one day at a time, but the amount of data we're analyzing will always be seven days of data. So that's really important to note. So our method is called the quickest detection method. During our procedure, we analyze three different rolling window lengths, seven, 14, and 21 days. We also defined our distributions using three different buoys in Lake Erie. So we ran our analysis one time with the Stone Lab Gibraltar buoy as our baseline, and we used that to define that baseline distribution. And then we ran the analysis a second time using the Cleveland buoy as our baseline. And then our transition distribution was based on the baseline buoy we chose. And the Toledo, data is where we're trying to predict whether there is a bloom or not. That's our target site. During our analysis, we also set a minimum alarm threshold at 300 and we kept that constant. And the reason we kept it constant is when I did some analysis of changing that alarm threshold, it did not alter the date of the first alarm very much. So we just kept it constant for all of our analysis. And that minimum alarm threshold is in order to ensure that we don't have too many false alarms. In our final analysis, we also assumed that alarms before August were considered false alarms. Since we have so many years of analyzing blooms in Lake Erie, we know that the blooms are going to occur usually in August or September. So the alarms before August we consider to be too early and we consider them to be false. So here's a spread of the four years that we analyzed, the four years of data from 2015 to 2018. The blue curve is our target site, which is the Toledo buoy. The orange curve is the Stone Lab Gibraltar buoy, which was our first baseline. And then our second baseline was the Cleveland data. So if you notice with the Cleveland data, we only have the full season's worth of data for 2017 and 2018. So that's why we couldn't run the analysis for 2015 and 2016, because we did not have that complete data. Another important note is in 2015, our baseline experienced a bloom before our target site. So because of that, our baseline was not a reliable or stable baseline, and we expected some error for this analysis. 
if you notice in the other years, the baseline stayed much lower and much more consistent. So those years we expected some more reliable results. Then if you look at the severity of the bloom in terms of the aphycocyanin readings, in 2015 and 2017, they were extremely large blooms. And the 2016 and 2018 had very small blooms. So we're expecting very small or no alarms for those two low bloom years because it's not enough to trigger that alarm. And I also included the satellite images of the maximum extent of each of the blooms for the four years at the bottom. So here's our data for the four years with the 21 rolling day window and Gibraltar as our baseline. So the red and orange circles at the top represent when each alarm occurred. The hollow ones are the ones that occurred before August that we are considering to be invalid in some respects. And the ones that are filled in are the ones that occurred after August. So if you take a look at 2016 and 2018, there are no filled in circles. So in essentially that means we had no valid alarms for those years, which is kind of what we would expect because those blooms were so small in our target region. If you look at 2015, the filled in circles occurred right around the time and slightly after that major bloom event. So those alarms were considered late uh, and you can, based on our data from the previous slide on our baseline blooming first. That's why we thought maybe those alarms were late. In 2017, you can see the filled in alarms occurred well before that bloom event. And some of them appeared early. So those first three ones were about a month in advance. The next three were about a week in advance of that major bloom event. So that is important to note for our analysis. So if we take into account the error in the 2015 baseline buoy, the method worked in all of our cases. So with the Gibraltar baseline, it correctly predicted the 2017 bloom for all three rolling windows and correctly omitted the 2016-2018 blooms with all three rolling windows. However, we aren't sure that the timing for that 2017 alarm was actually appropriate. So essentially this method is a work in progress. We will need to calibrate our model and test it out many, many more times in order to see if it actually is working properly for Lake Erie. And future things that we could try out are alternate methods of determining the distribution. In our methodology, we used a dynamic distribution, which updates every single day throughout the season. In a previous version of this study, they used a static distribution, which was defined at the beginning of the season and kept the same throughout the season. And that model is a little bit more robust against gaps in the data because if you have gaps during the dynamic distribution method, you can't recalculate it on a rolling basis. So that's kind of one of the issues with the dynamic. However, it does capture some of the weather variabilities. So that's one advantage to the dynamic. We could also try a longer rolling window, which might not be as susceptible to blips in that variance of the phycocyanin and might give us more accurate alarms. We also need to analyze more existing buoys and make sure this method works across the lake in different locations. And we'd also like to survey water treatment plant managers to see exactly how much time they want before a bloom event uh, so they can dispense those chemicals in order to treat the water. And I'd like to thank uh, Stone Laboratory for hosting this remote REU. This was my last chance for an undergraduate REU since I am going to be a senior. So I very much appreciate having this remote opportunity. And thank you to Darren Beatty for taking me on this summer. I really appreciate it. Um, we got all of our data from the Great Lakes Observing System website. And thank you to NOAA Ohio Sea Grant and Friends of Stone Laboratory for making this REU possible.
Thank you, Alexis. Uh, any questions? I don't see any questions coming in chat. Um, uh, I, I have a question, Alexis. Um, would, in your mind, it's kind of your opinion, would the water plants be more concerned about toxins the blooms produce? Yes, absolutely. Um, from my knowledge of water treatment in bloom events, they do have to filter out the cells, which would be a, a reflection of the biomass of the algal bloom. But I think the toxins are more of a concern because they can harm human health. Right. Uh, so these sensors cannot measure toxins. Um, so would you envision this being a, a two-part like a, an early warning for them to either take a sample or an early warning for them to bump up treatment just in case if there are toxins and they don't have time to do uh, an analysis? That's a very good question. I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to use this alarm as a way of notifying them to take that uh, toxin reading. And we actually did briefly look at kind of the correlation between algal biomass and that toxicity. Um, but we'd have to do a bit more analysis to see if there is some kind of correlation between that. But yeah, I agree that this alarm might be used for testing for that toxin rather than maybe jumping right into dispensing treatment for a toxin. Okay, great. Um... So I, I'm not sure if I'm having technical difficulties, but my computer is WebEx seems to be frozen. So I don't know if, if there are any other questions in the chat function or not. I am not seeing any other chat questions, at least none that were sent um, to me or to all participants. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna assume that uh, maybe WebEx will start working again for me. Um, um, do you see any questions yet? Any other questions? Oh, okay. There we go. Um, let's see. One person is asking whether a false positive or a false negative alarm would be worse for a water treatment plant operator? Hmm. So if it were theoretically, that would be not having alarm and we should have an alarm. I feel like that might be more detrimental to have a false negative because it wouldn't be I guess the hope for this method is to have multiple methods of checking for blooms so that we're very secure in it. So I would assume they'd have other methods as a backup going on at the same time. So if there were a false negative, meaning we didn't have an alarm and we should, I'm assuming that other methods of monitoring would catch that. If it were a false positive, it would certainly be less detrimental because they'd be looking for things when they don't really need to be. So to answer your question, the false negative will probably be more done. All right. Okay. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, I have one more question, if you'd like. OK. Um, Doug Kane is asking how your math background um, helped you with this RE. Yeah, so my stats background really helped me understand the standard deviation and that rolling window standard deviation. Without my stats background, I probably would not have grasped this project very well. So I really, really, I'm really glad I have that math background. Okay. Um, just to do some troubleshooting while we're at it. Um, Justin, if your computer is being weird, it might be easiest to just sign out of WebEx completely and then come back. Um, 
that's what my plan was. So I'm going to, uh, our, our next speaker is, is Elaine, and I'm going to ask Dr. Kane to introduce, introduce her, and I am going to close out and hopefully re-sign in as quick as I can. Thank you. Hi, this is Doug Kane, uh, formerly of Defiance College. Well, I guess for another week at Defiance College, and then um, then I will be at Heidelberg University. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Alina Hess, um, who is a student at Florida Southern College in Lakeland, Florida, um, which is where the Detroit Tigers have their spring training, uh, baseball starting back up, so that made me think of that. Cleveland used to, I think, have their spring training there. Um, but she is a native of Fairport Harbor and has worked with the ODNR Division of Wildlife Lake Erie Fisheries Research Unit as a high schooler. And that made her the perfect person to work on this project. Um, this project, I did not actually think of it. Um, those of you know, that know John Hageman, the former lab manager at Stone Lab, he came to me and asked if I could find a student to work on this, and he was going to work more on the um, actual looking at the fish diets um, with her. But of course, then COVID-19 came, but we, we had a plan B, which was to use the data that ODNR had been collecting. Uh, for this project, we focused on the Western Basin, uh, but maybe next year we can have the Central Basin too and, and look work on that. Um, I don't think, uh, I think that's about it. And uh, I, I uh, yield the presentation to Alina. Thank you, Dr. Kane. So I looked at the diet composition of the yellow perch and white perch in the Western Basin, and we were primarily focused on whether Bithotrephes longimanus were becoming more important in their diets. So what are Bithotrephes? So they are a large predatory cladocerin, so they can get up to about 150 millimeters in length, and they feed on other copepods and rotifers and other cladocerins. Now they're commonly referred to as the spiny water flea, so they have these really long caudal spines that are really hard material that you can see over here. And those can actually make up about 70 to 80% of their total body length. And they use those as a defense against predators. And they tend to be found in temperate to cooler waters. And they're originally native to Northern Europe and Asia. But they have found their way into our Great Lakes. They were originally thought to have been brought over through the ship ballast waters, and then once the first lakes were contaminated, they made their way through the rest of the waterways, probably through contaminated fishing gear. So they first appeared in Lake Huron in December 1984, then later in Superior in September of 1985, and they were first documented being in Lake Erie in October in 1995, but it is predicted that they were within the lake much earlier before we even knew about them. So why do we care? Why do we want to look at the spiny water fleas within our fish? So the reason is that many of the predatory fish, such as the yellow perch and the white perch, are fish that we eat. So we care about them in general for our fishing industries. So they have begun feeding on the bithotrephes, and they found that the larger fish are eating the larger bithotrephes. So they have the larger, longer spines. And the issue with these spines is that when they consume the that the spines can be retained in the fish's stomach for a long amount of time and not easily or very quickly digested. So as the spines are retained in their stomachs, they can give them a false sense of fullness, so they're not going to continue eating. And then they can also receive internal puncture wounds from them, so it can actually harm their insides and cause them to die. And it's also been found that, that their growth rates are being slowed down. So ultimately, this means that the bigger fish or since they are eating them, the bigger fish are the ones that are dying off. So that means if we're going out to catch the fish, that we're going to have to end up catching the smaller fish who aren't as likely to be dying from the bithotrephes, which in return means that your dinner plate that you're eating of your yellow perch is going to be smaller. 
So some of the items that the yellow perch and white perch eat are shown here. They have a large variety of different prey items that they feed on. But some of the big ones are the Daphneas, the Leptodora kinti, the Hexagenias, the Bosnias, the Amphipods, and the Cyclopoids, which are all pictured here. So for this study, we looked at the white perch data from 1990 to 2005, and then yellow perch data from 1989 to 2004. And this data was from the Sandusky Fish Unit from ODNR. And each year they sampled fish from May through September. The sample size varied depending on the day. But over here on this map, you can see all those dots were sections where they were sampled and they collected the fish by using trawls. And once they were collected, each fish was given a unique fish ID. And then as they were taken back to the lab, their lengths and weights were recorded as well as their sex and then their stomach content fullness, whether it was full, empty, or partially full. And then once they were taken back to the lab, a diet analysis was performed on each one of them to find their diet composition. So here's where the average total length for both the white perch and yellow perch through the years. This was just the average of the sample size. The majority of them range from about 150 to 180 millimeters in length. So for our analysis and statistics, we looked at the percentage of bithotrephes found in each sample for each year for both species, as well as across the 15 year span. And we also looked at the number of individual bithotrephes, so the count that was in their diet each year as well. We performed some chi-square tests as well as regression tests. And for those, we looked at the length versus the year and the percent and number of bithotrephes, as well as the amount of chironomids they were feeding on with against the bithotrephes they were feeding on. And we found the p-value for each one of those. And like I said, we looked at that for each individual year as well as the 15 year time span across both species. So getting into the yellow perch results, we found that there were five years where there were no bithotrephes present in the diets from the sample. Those years were 1991, 1995, 1996, 2002, and 2004. And within the 15 year time span, collectively there were 10,686 prey items found that were analyzed. And within the 15 years out of those 10,000 prey items, the top three groups were the chironomids, the hexagenias, and the bithotrephes. So the bithotrephes made it into the third highest at 10.5%, the hexagenias were 15%, and the chironomids were 15.6. So majority of the individual years for the yellow perch, the bithotrephes made up about 0 to 5.1 percent of their diet, which isn't a whole lot, but they are still there. But however, three years had pretty high increases in the amount of bithotrephes that were there, and these were years 1989, 1998, and 2003. So over here on the left is the overall diet composition through the 15-year time span. So you can see the biggest group was over here, the hexagenias and the chironomids. And the bithotrephes was third with 1,123 individuals found in their diets. And then over here on the right was our first year where there was a pretty big increase. So compared to the 0 to 5% that bithotrephes normally made up, and this year they made up about 19.2% in 1989. And then they continued to increase over the next two spikes. So our next one was 1998, when they made up about 32.9% of the overall diet. And in 2003 was the largest amount of bithotrephes, which was 399 individuals, or 53.1% of their overall diet composition that year. So here were the counts, as well as the percentage of bithotrephes across all the years. So you can see there were the pretty high spikes in these three years compared to the 0 to 5% that we were normally finding across the board. And then here were the results from our amount of chironomids and the amount of bithotrephes. So moving on to the white perch, we found very similar results, but not identical. So we also had about four years that there were no bithotrephes at all in the diet composition. That was 1995, 1996, 2004, and 2005. And overall, there are about 8,389 collective prey items, so a little bit less than the yellow perch. But their top three were very similar with the chironomids at 22.7%. The bithotrephes here were second at 12.9%, and 
than the amphipods at 10.8%. So here the bithotrephy is made up about 0 to 7.7%, which is a little bit more than the yellow perch. But they as well had about three pretty high increase years, which were 1998, 2001, and 2003. So over here on the left was their overall diet composition. The bithotrephy is made up about 13.1%, which was the second most preyed upon item across the 15 year time span. And then 1998 was their first big spike compared to their usual 0 to 7%, which was 367 individuals at 38% of their diet. So a pretty big increase there. And then the next two years were 2001, where they were the second highest with 119 individuals. And this year we had a pretty big increase of the chironomids as well. They made up almost 50% of their overall diet. And then 2003 was the biggest increase of the trephi, making up 44%, which was 263 individuals that were counted. So here are the percent versus the counts. So we did have some other smaller peaked years in both, but the highest ones you can still see were pretty significant and increased compared to the bottom years where it was about the zero to seven percent. And there were the chironomids versus the bithotrephes. So overall between both the white perch and yellow perch, we found that the consistent the three consistent years between both species where there were none were 1995, 1996, and 2004. And then both of them had a high increase in bithotrephes in 1998 and 2003. So there are some theories about why this may have happened. So the bithotrephes are more abundant when the lake temperatures are cooler. So their availability may be due to the different lake temperatures throughout the year. If they were cooler years, they may have been more abundant. Another theory is that it could be due to their prey availability in the area at the time. So one of their big prey items were the amphipods. They made up a pretty big group. They were in the top three for both years overall. But if you look at the yellow perch for 1989, the amphipods are about 15.4%, but they decreased pretty sharply in 98 and 2003, where we had those really high increase in bithotrephes. They were only at 1.2% and 0.5%. And the same trend followed in the white perch. 98 was 5.7%, and they took those pretty hard declines in 2001 and 2003, about 0.1% and 0.3%. So another thing with that prey availability is they found in a study previously by Hayward that the growth rates are higher in the central basin compared to the western basin where we looked at that. So the growth changes of the yellow perch, they found that were due directly to the food supply. So their prey availability was different compared to the central basin, making it harder for them to find food and their food consumption was suppressed, so their growth rates were suppressed as well. And then another study done by Schaefer in 1986 found that the competition between the species could also influence the growth weights. So we found that the white perch and yellow perch had a lot of overlap in their diets. They weren't completely identical, but they do feed on many of the same prey items. So they found that their study was in 81 and 82. Their main prey items for both groups were those chironomids and clytoserins. So if we have both species competing for the same amount of food, they will have to adjust what they're eating if they're not able to find that. So it looks like that the yellow perch were not able to access the same amount of food as the white perch were, resulting in their slower growth rates in the Western Basin. So overall, in conclusion, we found that the bithotrephes have made their way into the Great Lakes as an established member of the community. And they have shown that they are an alternative food source to our predatory fish like the white perch and yellow perch. However, they do still have negative impacts on the fish that can cause their growth rates to slow and cause death in general. But overall, they have proven to be an alternate member of the prey. Their abundance has been fluctuating throughout the years, which could be due to the prey availability as well as lake temperatures. So for future research, we could look at more recent years and keep a consistent sample size for the amount of yellow perch and white perch collected each day which might help to ensure that the data is more accurate. And then we can also look at zooplankton abundance in 
the same years to look at in correlation with the bithotrephes and the yellow birch diet to see if there was a change, a large change in prey availability for those years. So I'd like to thank everyone at Stone Lab for helping me make this REU possible, as well as my supervisor, Dr. Doug Kane, and the ODNR Sandusky Fish Station for giving us our research data. And here are my works cited. And that is all. So thank you very much. If you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Alina. Uh, a question from Dr. Beatty. Um, he wants to know, were Bethotrephes present in fish diets before they were officially recognized in the lake? Yes, I believe they were. They were being noticed. They just weren't being studied. So there wasn't a huge draw for all the diets within those recent early years. But as they started showing up more often, they did start doing more diet studies on them. Huh. That's interesting. Um, uh, Christina asks, are white perch invasive? I believe they were introduced. I'm not 100% sure, but they did follow after the yellow perch. Yeah, yeah uh, white perch are, are an invasive species. Um, another question, do these diets have negative impact on fish reproduction? That I haven't looked into yet, so that could be a future research study that we could look at, looked at as well. Those studies previously have really just focused on their growth rates. Okay. All right. I, I have a question. Um, this year, the Western Basin, we're seeing a lot of low oxygen near the bottom. So like the bottom meter um, is running out of oxygen. Uh, knowing these the fish's diets, would you expect this year, uh, would you expect more bifotrephes or less bifotrephes in perch diet? I would probably expect there to be more since they do tend to live in the upper to middle water column, so they might be more available for them to consume. Okay, great. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So let's all thank Alina. And I will ask Dr. Susan Gray to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. This is Suzanne Gray. Um, so Elizabeth Tieford worked for me, worked with me this summer. Um, she is a, a forestry fisheries and wildlife major in the School of Environment and, and oh my goodness. I'm tired. Um, School of Environment Natural Resources at OSU. Um, I actually met Elizabeth last summer. She took my fish taxonomy course up at Stone Lab. So um, it was great that she got that experience and I got to see how hard she was willing to work in a four week course in extreme heat and, and weather and such things. Um, so I was really excited when I saw her application for an REU uh, to do a fish project. And um, we had this idea of a fish project that would have involved um, some fun fishing for walleye on Lake Erie, but because of COVID, she ended up um, doing a, an exciting project looking at the data of other people getting to fish on Lake Erie. So uh, I was just really thrilled that she was still willing to um, work with me on this data set that you know, I've had for a few years and just never taken the opportunity to work with the data set because we're always, you know, out on the lake. So with that, I will hand it over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Dr. Gray, for that introduction. Um, like she said, we are looking at other people's data that they collected and kind of comparing it to um, the algal bloom surveys as well as the krill surveys. So what we're going to be looking at is the effects of harmful algal blooms on Lake Erie's recreational walleye fishery. So as many of you know, and as kind of Alexis very elegantly uh, introduced, Lake Erie has a history with harmful algal blooms and most recently they have been closely monitored um, 
as you can see in this photo in front of you, this was the harmful algal bloom in 2015, which had a severity index of 10.5, which is the highest that we have seen to date so far. And as she stated, the um, harmful algal blooms can affect a lot of the wildlife that is around Lake Erie as well as within it, and that includes the fish. And that leads us to the walleye. So as many of you have probably seen and heard, they have had um, successful recruitment years here recently for the walleye fishery. And a lot of fishermen are out on Lake Erie right now fishing for these um, walleye. And um, we wanted to look at and see if the um, severe, if the increased severity of the harmful algal blooms is infecting is affecting the um, recreational walleye fishery within Lake Erie's waters. So the research question that we proposed was how do harmful algal blooms affect the recreational walleye fishery on Lake Erie? So to do that, we kind of came up with an objective and that was to access angler fishing behavior and success across years with different levels of harmful algal blooms. And we kind of came up with three predictions with three different variables. So the first prediction that we had was that angler hours would decrease as algal bloom severity increased because a lot of fishermen perceive harmful algal blooms as a, um, they, a lot of times they like to go out onto the water and just like to view the clear waters. It's an intrinsic value. And with the um, algal blooms floating on the water, they're green. And that's just something that um, fishermen perceive is um, not very pleasing to the eye. So we figured that that would end up decreasing the angry hours over the years. Um, our second prediction had to do with catch per unit effort of the walleye. And we figured that that would also decrease as uh, algal bloom severity increased. And then prediction number three that we had was the mean total seasonal catch of walleye would end up decreasing as algal bloom severity increased as well. So that was our three main predictions that we had throughout this study. So throughout our method, um, we were able to, we were given a summary of krill survey data from the years of 1989 to 2017. And what we did, we focused on the data from the months of July through September during the years of 2002 to 2017. And the main reason why we focused on July through September was because that's when um, that's when the harmful algal blooms and any algal bloom is at its pe highest peaks is during those months and that's whenever they become very apparent. And the reason why we focused to the years 2002 to 2017 was for the simple matter of that's the data that we had available through the, um, uh, the um, lost my words, the harmful algal bloom severity index. That's the data that we had available for those. So the variable that we looked at, as I explained before, was um, angler hours, catch per unit effort of walleye, and total seasonal catch of walleye. So as you can see over here is the interview form on the left that they, um, that krill surveyors actually give the fishermen. And what they do is they put their start time and their finish time, and we are able to calculate how many hours that each fisherman was out on the water fishing. So catch per unit effort of walleye is how many fish were caught during a set period of time. So with this crow survey data, I was able to look at how many fish was harvested and how many fish were released and how many hours they fished during that time. So what I did was I would um, add the harvested amount plus the released amount and I would divide that by how many hours that the fishermen were fishing during that time. And that's how I would get the catch per unit effort of walleye. And then the total seasonal catch of walleye, I just added the, um, the caught and released. And I added all that together and got the mean for that whole um, season. 
So the other methods that we used was looking at the harmful algal bloom severity index. And as you can see in this table from NOAA, this is the um, severity index from all the previous years and the predicted for this year, which um, I believe they just had a conference over here recently. And um, basically what a severity index is, it's the biomass of algae within the water over a period of time. And the biomass is kind of just an estimated um, algal, uh, estimated amount of algae within the water at that time. So we use those severity index, we use the severity index in relation to the other variables to see if there were relationships between. So kind of how we analyzed our data, we used general linear regressions to test for relationships between the harmful algal bloom severity indexes during the years of 2002 through 2017. So on the on the, the um, this slide and the next coming slide, you will see on the left that there is July through September data and August only data. And we used um, the July through September data as a whole study. And then we kind of did, last minute did an August only study to, since that's usually whenever um, the algal blooms would peak is in August. So we kind of looked at both of those and to see if there was any relationships between the harmful algal bloom severity index and the um, other variables. So here you can see the total angler hours data and you can see that there was no significance with the July through September data, but in the August only data on the right, you can see that um, there was a positive trend and the ang total angler hours. This one shows the mean angler hours through July through September and August only. And August and in the August only month of all the all the years through 2002 to 2015, uh, well through 2017, I mean. Um, there was a significance within that data. So you could see that there were um, the mean angler hours was slightly affected by um, the severity of the harmful algal bloom. And this one shows the mean catch per unit effort of walleye. And you can see that there is no um, significance between either the July through September data or the August only data. And then the mean total catch, there was also no significance within the data, as you can see in both graphs. So to summarize what um, we found is there was a positive trend between harmful algal bloom severity index and the total angler hours during August, but not across the whole season. Um, there was a positive significant relationship between the harmful algal bloom severity index and the mean angler hours in August, but not throughout the whole season. And then there was no relationship between the have severity index and catch per unit effort or the mean total catch of walleye. And we noticed after looking at some of the recruitment data that there could have possibly been um, a relationship between fishermen basing their um, fishing throughout the years on the recruitment and the number of walleye in the lake um, during those years, which was predicted each year by ODNR. So that kind of leads us uh, very nicely into the future directions. So um, if this study was to be done again next summer, um, it would be very beneficial to incorporate the recruitment and walleye population data to test for relationships between the harmful algal blooms, um, the population and angling behavior to see if um, there was any relationships there. Um, another thing that would be a good direction is to be using monthly chlorophyll data from buoys in Lake Erie because the harmful algal bloom severity index is a very coarse measurement that is a collection of algal bloom data throughout the whole season. 
So that kind of narrowed down our um, data a little bit. So there is data available that, um, that you can look at for this. This is the Hobbs data, uh, data portal through GLO, GLOS. And this is from the um, buoy right off of Gibraltar Island. And this is from uh, 2015. So this data is very well accessible. You can download it as an Excel file and you can look at the data and compare it to um, the other variables that we had previously looked at in our study. So this would be something that would be very beneficial to incorporate within the study to see um, if there was any relationships there. So I would like to acknowledge quite a few people that have helped me throughout this um, research. So Travis Hartman from ODNR, I would like to thank him for supplying the krill survey data. Um, Dr. Chelsea Neiman, who I was able to um, meet last year during my class with Dr. Gray, she did a very awesome job at summarizing this krill survey data so I did not have to go through and um, go and summarize all of it because there was over 100,000 rows of data. So I'm very, um, very thankful for her for summarizing a lot of it for me in the past years. Next, I'd like to thank Dr. Suzanne Gray for continuing to advise my project, even through this virtual forum. I know it was very trying for the both of us and it was very different. Um, I'd really like to thank Dr. Ch uh, Justin Chaffin for making this experience possible for all the REUs when most of the other REU programs were canceled. Um, as we talked about at the beginning, there was only a few REU programs that were still um, up in the air for students like us to be able to learn from. And I'd like to thank all of the um, donors who were able to support this research experience, including John Kreitz, um, former chair of EEOB, Thomas Langlois, former director of Stone Laboratory, and Jul uh, Julius and Kate Stone. So I'd like to thank all of them. So um, that's all I have. If anyone has any question, I would be willing to answer them. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. A uh, question from Dr. Kane. Uh, Dr. Kane says, so the take home message is that anglers will put up with bad algal blooms as long as there are walleye out there to be caught. He continues, this is important because it goes against what we have heard from charter boat captains in the past. Um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, to go further on, some of the charter captains we work with say they will move their boat or cancel trips when there are bad alga blooms. Um, so, how, so how do you take that question or comment that uh, anglers will put up with a bad bloom as long as there are walleye out there? So I do agree with that statement. Um, I do know going through a lot of research papers, I found that a lot of um, fishermen who were fishing on charter boats, they found that they were willing to pay more to the charter to drive them further away from an algal bloom to be able to catch more walleye. So that is something to incorporate as well. But yes, I think that fishermen are more, more willing to go out and go fishing and tolerate the kind of the ugliness of the algal bloom if there is walleye to be caught. Okay, there's uh, two questions from that I think are similar, quickly reading them. Uh, did the anglers fish in the area of the lake where there blooms? You know, that is, could the anglers uh, be fishing in the bloom or could they be fishing on the edge of the bloom or outside of the bloom? So through the krill survey data, they had different um, areas where they were fishing. So from the data, from what I've seen, the fishermen were fishing within the algal bloom as well as outside of. So it was a nice distribution between. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's okay. I think that addresses the, the other questions too. Um, okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Elizabeth.
All right, our last and final speaker, I'll ask uh, Dr. James Marshall to introduce Rose. Hey, everybody. Uh, as my ornithologist friends would agree, birds are best, and therefore that's why they're last. Uh, you may not agree, sorry. Uh, my RU students are usually studying tabs, although we talk about them as harmful, angry birds, uh, which usually if we're up there, there's at least one red-winged blackbird that attacks us while we're there, so that's uh, usually apt. But we couldn't get at them this year. So instead, we took a look at some questions that we've had data for for a long time, but have never had an opportunity to look at. So Rose Wetzel comes to us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where she's a rising senior at Susquehanna University. She's an ecology major which I appreciate. Um, and she has an interest long-term in restoration ecology. But this summer though, she's been looking at uh, our, our bird data over the last nine years or so. So I'll let Rose take it away. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Um, I am Rose Wetzel and we this summer have been looking at body condition and survivorship of breeding birds on the Lake Erie Islands. As you can see from the map here on the left, um, the Lake Erie Islands and Great Lakes region is in the path of two major mi uh, migration flyways. And so this area is really important to migratory birds. They can stop on the islands and either rest or collect food, um, or they can wait for the appropriate winds, whether if that's a tailwind or a headwind, to take them north or south, depending on the season. And with animals such as these migratory birds in mind, um, we have two preserves that were transformed from more human-dominated habitat um, into preserves. So a lot of human structures were taken out and uh, native succession of native plants was allowed to occur. What we wanted to look at this summer was whether the work on these preserves has paid off in terms of providing additional benefit for breeding birds. One of the ways we looked at this was looking at their survivorship, which is their survival from year to year. And another way was looking at their body condition index. So we know that if preserves are providing valuable habitat, birds will have better condition in these areas. And lastly, we wanted to look at whether our future data will still be valuable and usable, even though no data was collected this summer. And that will probably be an important question for any researcher who has a simul similar situation where they were unable to get data this summer because of COVID-19. So for our study sites, we had three different human-dominated habitats, and one of these was on Gibraltar Island. We basically hang up mist nets from one side of the island to the other, um, and this is considered human-dominated because we have things like the stone lab, cottages, and dining hall and other buildings. We also have a site in the North Bass Island Vineyards, and we have a site around the Stone Lab Bayview office. Like I mentioned, we also have the two preserves, which are on Middle Bass Island and South Bass Island. Our data collection began in the year 2011, and the last year of data we have for this summer was the 2019 data, since this summer no one was at the islands to collect it. Each summer we visit the same five locations and we visit once, we visit each location, location once each, each week. Uh, we usually hang up these mist nets, which you can see in the picture from about 7.30 a.m. until noon. And this allows us to grab the birds that fly in and get caught in these pockets like the tree swallows on the left. And we can then mark the birds with a band that shows us if we catch it Another year in the future, it shows us we've already caught it, or it can show other birders um, that someone else has caught it. And we can also collect measurements from these birds, such as wing length, weight, age, or sex. And it's important to note here that for two species, the northern cardinal and the red-winged blackbird, we use Tarsus data, which um, is the part of the bird's foot that the band is attached to, and it's just a better indication of body condition because it's not subject to change as much as wing length is. Um, and that data was collected by the Stone Lab Evolution course. One of the ways we study these birds is using a program called MARC. And MARC 
uses our recapture rates to estimate the yearly survivorship. What that means is that in an ideal world, we would be able to recapture every single bird that survived. But because this is not an ideal world, we capture about 10% of the birds that survive. Um, and so Mark just uses that 10% or whatever it happens to be for a particular year to estimate how many birds have actually survived. We used the red-winged blackbird and American robin data for our survivorship estimates. They were the only two survivorship estimates we did because we have the most data on those species and therefore it's enough to provide us reliable estimates. For these simulations, we looked at the short term by removing the year 2018. Um, you can think about it like next year, we won't have 2020, so, um, it shows us what 2021 data might look like because we do have the year 2019, but for the simulation, we removed the year 2018. And for a longer term look at things, we removed the year 2014. To begin our body condition index, we had to disregard any species that um, didn't have more than 25 recaptures because it just is not enough data. And we also removed from any species, we removed the hatchier aged birds, um, which are very young birds that would skew our body condition index positively because they tend to have a lot of body fat since they're still being cared for. And to create this body condition index, we did a linear regression using wing length versus weight. And it's also important to note here that for the red-winged blackbird and northern cardinal, we did use that tarsus data that I was talking about earlier. Um, and the data here, the body condition index rather, is actually just the residuals of that regression that we created. So you can see here from the graph, um, any uh, bird that has a dot above the line would be a bird that's in better than average condition, and one below the line would be representing a bird with below average condition. After we formatted all our data, we used a t-test to determine whether there was any significant difference between human-dominated habitat and preserves. Going back to our survivorship estimates for a minute, these are our graphs for the American robin. As you can see, the blue bars representing 2019 are pretty close to the orange bars representing our 2020 simulation. And um, most of these numbers are pretty similar to what our real expected range of survivorship would be, which would be about 50%. The same holds true for our red-winged blackbird survivorship simulations. And the reason this graph here on the left looks a little bit different is because for um, this, for this survivorship estimate, Mark estimated it using a model that did not um, take into account the different habitat types. So it was actually, con survivorship was constant over uh, habitat types and was not dependent on that. It was dependent on time. Moving along to our body condition index, um, I'm gonna start with several species who did not have a significant difference. Um, and that was most of our species. One of these is the bar barn swallow, which um, did not have a significant difference between human dominated habitat and preserves, but it did show um, kind of negative condition in both of these areas. And the house finch showed um, the same trend and was still not statistically significantly different between these habitat types. Again, the red-winged blackbird, not statistically significant, but it did do a little bit better in human dominated areas. And it's important to note here, you can see our error bars are pretty large. Um, that is because of our recapture rate, which is very low. The American robin is another bird with, um, with no statistically significant difference, but it's doing a little bit better in human dominated areas, as is the tree swallow, which is still not a statistically significant difference. The American goldfinch, still not a, dif a significant difference, but it is doing better in preserve which was very uncommon for our species. And the Northern Cardinal, again, not significant, but it does have a better condition in human dominated areas. 
The first of our birds that did have a significant difference was the brown-headed cowbird, and it is doing better again in human-dominated areas, um, which we don't consider necessarily a bad thing for this species because it's a brood parasite, um, so it might be sort of risking other birds' nesting success. And the Baltimore Oriole also was statistically significant, um, the difference between its habitat types, and it did show a better body condition in the human-dominated areas. The yellow warbler was our last species and did show a significant difference, and it was doing a lot better in human-dominated areas. To go back to our initial question of whether preserves are providing good breeding habitat, we unfortunately did not see any evidence of this in, um, in our study because when we looked at survivorship and body condition index, most of them did not have any sort of significant difference between these two habitat types. But when we did see any, any difference, um, the birds were often doing better in human dominated areas. So therefore our data suggests that the preserves are not quite as good nesting habitat and reasons we theorize this might be true are because these preserves are extremely small. Um, so bigger preserves might actually provide better nesting habitat, um, but with the way they are, um, density of birds that are actually using these areas could provide a stressor on nesting birds, as could predation, which might not be as frequent in um, human-dominated areas because of the abundance of predators. However, a nesting success study would be recommended to truly gauge the value of these preserves to birds. And the reason we haven't been able to collect that data is because the REU students don't come up um, to Stone Lab in the right part of the summer for that. The bottom line is that even though we haven't seen a clear um, value for nesting birds, these preserves are still valuable. Um, they're valuable for many other species, such as the Lake Erie water snake, which is endemic to the area. And other birds, um, such as these, which are considered um, either endangered or threatened by the state of Ohio, have been sighted on the islands. Um, even though we haven't evidenced them in our study, um, those could be birds that are also benefiting from these areas. I would like to thank Stone Lab for having this opportunity. Um, like Alexis, I am a rising senior, so it would be my last chance to, to be an REU student. So I'm really grateful I got that opportunity and that everything was carried out even with this tough virtual situation. So thank you to Dr. Marshall for being my advisor. Um, and I'd also like to extend my thanks to Lisa Broll, who helped me with a lot of um, either curious questions I had or questions on the islands and the preserves in general, um, because I am interested in restoration ecology. So she gave me some knowledge into the plants and these other bird species. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rose. Uh, we, have, we have some questions. Um, they need to slow down so I can read them. Um, you mentioned the mist nets are checked once a week. So our local predators, hang on. Every time someone asks a question, the words jump on me. Um, the, so I, th I think the clarifying question for your methods, um, are your mist nets are checked once a week. Are there local predators that may get to the, the birds, uh, get, get to the captured birds before you do? So can I think you that, oh, your sorry. Methods? Um, that's a bit more of a question of how I explained it. So um, we actually hang up the mist nets and take them down. And so the birds would just be flying in there from when we were there from 7.30 a.m. until noon. And then we can just grab any bird that flies into there and we can um, mark them. And that way they're not at, in danger to predators for a very long time. Great. Uh a uh, question from Dr. Kane. Uh, the cowbirds are an edge species and thus would probably expect them to do well in humans, with humans who make the edges. Do you know if the Baltimore Orioles are considered an edge species? I don't. Um, I know they're a little bit more of a, hab le uh, sorry, a less of a habitat generalist than say the American robin or the red-winged blackbird, which can pretty much do well anywhere. 
Um, Dr. Marshall was saying he's seen them in his neighborhood, which would certainly be probably human dominated habitat. Um, so I haven't seen them in my neighborhood, but I know that um, they're a little bit less, they're a little bit more sensitive to habitat type. Uh, was there an existing habitat suitability index for any of these species? And if so, do you, did you compare the test sites to see if they were within the range of the index? Um, I did not look into that, but that would definitely be an interesting thing to do for future study. Uh, a, a question I have, um, uh, kind of a two-part question. When, uh, when any of these birds are, are feeding, uh, um, hey, how far away will they fly to find food? And B, could they be, could they be making their home in the preserve, but flying to the human dominated system to find food? Uh, and then that's where you catch them. So I think for some of our islands, they could be flying to different sites. So like South Bass Island, where we have a lot going on, we have the preserves and we have a lot of human dominated areas. Um, I could certainly see them flying across South Bass Island, but they're not going to hop from island to island a lot. Um, so some of our smaller islands, they probably wouldn't cross between those human dominated habitats and preserves as much. Okay, great. Um, that was, I don't see any more questions for Rose. So, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Winslow, our, our director, joined. And if Chris, would you like to uh, make any comments? Yeah, I apologize that I couldn't uh, make it on for all of the presentations, but the ones I was able to hear, um, as usual, just impressive. Um, so, this has been phenomenal for me to to wrap out my work day to day, listen to these great talks. And I did want to take uh, time to echo some of the thanks from the from the REUs to, to Justin and our supervisors. Uh, I just love the creativity that uh, Justin and that team put forward. So Dr. Kane and Dr. Marshall, Dr. Beatty, Dr. Gray, just to, to open up your, your schedules to allow for this to occur virtually. So thanks to the, the supervisors and, and wow, just amazing work from our REUs. And I want to just give a shout out to Dr. Jan Weisenberg, our senior associate VP. She loves this event. She has not missed many. And for her to join virtually, this is exciting to see too. So thanks everybody for all your work um, with these presentations today. All right, thank you everyone um, for joining. I want to thank the, the panelists, or I guess the students and the supervisors. Um, want to thank the attendees. I've been keeping a rough count on the attendees, but there was quite a few um, who've been outside our, our normal weekly meetings. So I want to thank them for, for joining and, and contributing to the, the questions. Uh, with that, I would uh, you know, just like to ask, are there any last parting comments or questions while we're all here? while all the REUs and supervisors are, are together. Justin, sorry to interrupt again. I would just love to say, remember, if any of this is to the level where the supervisors think this would be a great presentation, you know, even if it's at the Ohio Academy of Sciences or something like that, remember, come back to Justin and myself. Uh, we can cover some of the registration and, and a little bit of the travel for that, if not all, depending on if it's local or Hawaii. Um, so let us know on that. That would be uh, great. And if you're um, this COVID is really, we would normally be packing up to get on a boat and go over and get an ice cream cone. So if you're ever in Columbus or up on the islands, uh, you have my contact information. I'd love to take you out and celebrate. All right. Thank you, Chris, for the ice cream uh, offer. I'll, I'll definitely take you up next time I see you. All right, again, so, um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining. Uh, I want to thank the REUs for, for working hard um, in these challenging, difficult, but I, I believe it was rewarding for you. Um, it was definitely rewarding for me uh, you know, as a 
more of a a scientist um and i you know i don't teach so i didn't have to go through the quick learning process of all this virtual stuff um well i did have to go through just not at the same time that the the other supervisor the other supervisors did when they had to teach so so this was new new to me um i found it extremely valuable and and i know and i hope you you all did too so with that, I'll, I'll say goodbye, and um, I hope to see you. Um, hope we all can meet sometime. Um, if you're ever it, out at South Bass and we're open, uh, you know, feel free to stop by and say hello. All right. All right thank you, everyone. Congratulations, everybody.